Welcome everyone to the third of four lectures by one of the renowned sages of the last generation whose uh, legacy will have an impact on ours, our generation and many to come, Ellie Wiesel, uh, author, survivor, humanitarian, sage, um, Hasid. Elie Wiesel identified himself as a Vizhnitzer Hasid, which is one of the dynasties, till, till his last day. So uh, Hasidism is especially close to his soul. His, uh, his writings are all steeped in Hasidic teaching and learning. In fact, um, I think Professor Wiesel would say that Hasidism is not a branch of Judaism, it's the essence of Judaism, at least in his mind. So tonight we're gonna hear his reflections on one of the great Hasidic masters, the Gera Rebbe. Uh, Hasidism, as you know, arose in the 18th century. It, it arose in a time of great despair uh, in East European Jewry. Uh, it arose with passion and joy and thanksgiving precisely when the Jews could not see a reason for passion and joy and thanksgiving. That's part of its greatness. So uh, let's listen to Professor Wiesel, his reflections on the Gera Rebbe. And afterward, uh, we'll, have some, we'll have some time for some questions, comments, and thoughts. All blessings to all of you. And uh, please welcome the Neshama of Elie Wiesel. Tonight, let's forget, if possible, what is happening in the world today. Whatever is happening is not nice, not good, worrisome. Then why should we talk about it tonight? We talk about it every morning at breakfast or whenever we meet each other. Let's talk about something else. I invite you actually to a pilgrimage. Let's go far away to Europe, Eastern Europe to the end of the uh, 18th century and talk about a great movement whose liberations are felt even today. Surely here. Question. Is it conceivable that inside Hasidism there would be an extraordinary spiritual community that teaches that from the very depth of great personal sadness, a moving and powerful appeal is issued for continuous faith and renewed joy. No rabbi, no master, suffered more in his life than Rabbi Yitzchak Meir of Ger. And yet, how is it that his life story contains a warning not to give in to distress? His tales bring forth numerous questions. For instance, Hasidism is also based on f fellowship and friendship. But can the excess of either or love be counterproductive for the soul? Could too much affection become too dangerous for the mind? Or to quote a French poet, how far may one go too far? The master who is our subject tonight, Rabbi Yitzchak Meir of Ger, would probably answer in the affirmative. To him, both the mind and the soul are in constant need to be sharpened, challenged and awakened. Belonging to the third generation of the Bastian Hasidic movement, who knows, throughout generations of student and teachers with his books on biblical and Talmudic commentaries, who knows that his work 
what we call the Chidushei Ha'arim, the innovation of the commentaries, of the concept of learning that characterize him. Who knows that he, the founder of the School of Ger, which ranks today among the most pedagogically flourishing and politically influential movements in Israel and also, though to a lesser degree, even here in America. Who knows that this man actually was so exceptional and so extraordinary that whenever we read anything about him or by him, we tremble. I admit, I like him very much. But then I like them all, each and every one for his own way, his own quality, style and mystery. I like the Hasidic masters. Though I remained an admirer of Rabbi Nachman of Batzlav and his stories, as I was close to the late Rabbi, <coughs> Rabbi Menachem Mendel of Lubavitch of blessed memory, and therefore I claim then still claim my real total allegiance to Vizhnitz, that of my childhood. I continue to be attracted to the passion of learning and the fervor in worship one finds in the school of Ger. While still a bachelor, it is in a Gerer Stiebel, a small room on the ground floor on the 101st Street with my friend and ally Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel, we would come on the Sabbath and holidays to attend services in a nearby Gather Stiebel oratory. There we too part in the yet inspiring way of addressing our prayers to the Lord. Often we would meet their friends who remembered pre-war Gair, the label at Siviak, the Yiddish chronicler Rabbi Yosef Friedenson of the Warsaw Ghetto, Rabbi Vremel Zemba, all survived the Warsaw or the large ghettos. Some have returned even from Treblinka. While listening to them on the high holidays, crowning God as King of the universe, insisting on his divine justice and kindness, some of them, if not most of them, added to their own plight that of their first Rebbe, whose incomprehensible suffering on different levels, as we shall see later, preceded ours. A disciple and companion of great leaders, he too dominated the stage. Much is known about his public activities. From orally transmitted texts, chronicles and letters, we get a lot of material. But who was he in his personal life? Did it have its own inaccessible secrets? What shielded him in moments of great grief? How did he reconcile intransigent scholarship and warm compassion, kindness and rigor? How did he accomplish his own vision of Hasidism? And to whom did he transmit it? What was his concept of friendship? And how did he deal with its breakdowns? If there is in every one of us an event, an episode, an encounter, a question, a story that defines us, what was his? We know that since his childhood, nothing discouraged him. No one frightened him. He always found the right answer, the right words to get out of any situation. Naturally, to get acquainted with him, one must look at his environment. To observe a character, one must locate him. And there we witness the first dispute dividing the young Hasidic movement. It opposed the school of Pshische to the house of Kozhenitz, two places in Russia. Remember these true names, the two are pillars of the same edifice. In the beginning, since the revelation of Rabbi Israel Baal Shem Tov, the master of the good name, in 1736, his movement was a kind of non-violent, really peaceful revolution in Jewish life. 
his progression was turned inward. His goal, as well as his modus operandi, were to attract a family here, an individual there, going from place to place to influence or enrich people, mainly poor and melancholy, with a story, a song, a smile, a blessing, even a simple handshake. There were no intrigues, no jealousies, no personal power-seeking ambitions among the disciples, not yet. In reality, a serious and dangerous quarrel began only in 1772, when following the passing of the Besh, the founder, the great Magid, the great preacher, Rabbi Dovber of Mezerich, took over the helm and imposed his social architectural vision on the growing movement. At that point, his adversaries, particularly in Lithuania, where the prestige of the Gaon Rabbi Iliao from Vilna was unequaled, emerged as their institutional opposition. Ideologically and practically, they waged an organized campaign denouncing the Hasidim's behavior as heretical. Hasidim were accused of favoring prayer over study, of distorting old customs and rules, and these denunciations were meant to exclude them from the large community of Israel. In some cases, they turned to the police with weird political accusations. Some masters, as Rabbi Shnei of Zalman of Ladi, the founder of Chabad, Rabbi Israel of Rijin, were sent to prison. Still, these anti-Hasidic activities, though bitter and painful, never represented a serious threat to the Jewish people, for they came from the outside. Was it due to the astonishing success of which the Bastian movement could be so rightly proud? Its victories all over Central and Eastern Europe were numerous and glorious. Facing outside adversaries was easy, fighting inside opponents was not. We need also to remember almost overnight Hasidic schools and courts multiplied. It's simple. The Magi, the preacher of Mezerich, left many disciples who became masters themselves. And each of them did the same. Their sons established their own little, if not so little, kingdoms in small cities and villages, resulting in unavoidable frictions and disputes, rarely between leaders, but often between their assistants and followers. Each and every one saw in his master the only one worthy of wearing the Bastion crown. In the annals of secular revolutions, such phenomena were frequent. Splits and counter-splits among the Jacobins in France, communists and Mensheviks in Russia, Trotskyites of the left and the extreme left everywhere else. In general terms, we know that history is often shaped from the inside more than from the outside. And that is what happened also to Hasidism, so-called elite, which was concentrated first in Lublin and Pshische, and then in Pshische and Kozhenitz. We shall come closer to their fiery, impatient confrontations, and to the story of a great master filled with melancholy and grandeur, as soon as our patient lovers of Hasidism are invited to come in. Actually, after the passing of the Besh, the leader, the founder of the movement, and his successor, it was only normal of Hasidism, as experienced in Lublin, Kozhenitz, and Pshische, to go through upheavals and crises of loyalty. Could one belong to more than one school? Probably not. To follow more than one path? Surely not. Is it then possible that a regular Hasid defined himself by his opposition to the one facing him? And that an adept of the fierce and irascible master of Kotsk opposed all of them at the same time? 
At that time, one could lose one's orientation following the splits that plagued and perhaps on a certain level enriched the heritage of the founder. But Ger was not part of them. Ger remained Ger. What is Ger? In the enchanted kingdom of Hasidism, especially in its first developing phases, a master was distinguished by his miracles, another by his fervor, still another by his songs, or by his silence, and or by his methods to overcome despair. But as for Rabbi Yitzchak Meir of Ger, he was known by his passion for learning, in which he found his total fulfillment. Did it also help in frequent moments of distress? Born in 1799, still a boy, he lost his father, Rabbi Israel. He was the husband of Chaya Sore, the Magid or the preacher of Kozhenit's servant or niece. Legend preceded his birth. While still in his mother's womb, the preacher stood up when seeing the pregnant woman entering his study, saying, I pay respect not only to you, but also to your son to be born. He already is a sacred soul. Naturally, the preacher took care of the little orphan and watched over his education. He must have been, and indeed was, a precocious child, a fast learner, he surprised everyone with his quick answers to questions raised by illustrious adults. One day, the preacher turned to him and said, I'll give you a golden coin if you tell me where God dwells. And answered the boy, I will give you five golden coins if you tell me where he doesn't. Later, much later, evoking his childhood, he would say that at the age of eight, he would be able to see and hear Prophet Samuel himself and Prophet Elijah in person. Yes, he heard their voices. No wonder that the seer of Lublin com commented on his soul as being of high caliber. But he said, but people he will be made to suffer, he predicted, People will make him suffer. In fact, he believed him to be a kind of reincarnation of the Messiah, son of Joseph, the tragic of the two, who according to ancient sources will perish in an eschatological war. His reputation was so high that as an eight-year-old, he received a strange proposal from a wealthy businessman. His name was Rab Moshe Haft Halfan. He offered him to marry his daughter, but he wished to meet the young boy to know whether he, as he was called the Polish prodigy, really was a learned child. He submitted him to an examination, asking him a complex question drawn from the tractate of punishment. The young eight-year-old student gave him an immediate answer that baffled him by its originality and depth. The businessman right away realized that the boy's erudition surpassed his own. So on the spot, he made a decision. The student must become his son-in-law. Well, remember, in those times, everything was possible. Everything was possible because so many events occurred around them, around the Hasidic teachers and disciples, that they needed signs from heaven that their life and their destiny were actually protected and shielded. It is said that the student consented actually to get married although he had already received a number of similar proposals from prestigious families. The reason 
He was told that the girl in question was not really known, let's say, for her looks. She was small, with a big nose, and let's be elegant and charitable and say no more. <laughs> the story was transmitted so as to illustrate the master's humane nature and compassion. He felt that if he rejected her, no one would ever want to marry her. How could he be responsible for her humiliation? So the wedding took place. How old was he? Surely after his bar mitzvah, 13, or a bit later. Hasidic sources are known for their imprecision. One text mentions the figure 13, others make him younger or older. What we do know is that the preacher of Kozhenitz himself officiated at his wedding, which must have been celebrated in customary Hasidic exuberance and enthusiasm. An immediate problem. Rabbi Chayv Halfan, the father-in-law, wanted the couple to live in Warsaw with him, stay with him, eat at his table, and go forward in life. But the preacher preferred to have his famous Hasid and disciple with him in Kozhenitz. The problem reached Lublin for a ruling, and the famous seer of Lublin ruled in favor of the father-in-law. So the young Rabbi Yitzhak Meyer with his wife moved to the capital. To console the Magid, the preacher, he promised him frequent return visits. Then the preacher passed away. His son, Reb Moshe, the rich man, who succeeded him in the leadership position, treated the young scholar with special affection. Was he happy? The world outside was not a happy place. For the Hasidic movement, to difficult and troubling times were on the horizon with Napoleon, post-Napoleon's Europe, creating an atmosphere of fear and suffering. Three Hasidic masters, all famous and powerful, died the same year, 1815. The seer of Lublin, the preacher of Kozhenitz, and Rabbi Mendel of Riminov. Why? The three of them had taken part in a messianic conspiracy aimed at hastening redemption for our people and the world. They would meet in secret with no one else present, exploring together mystical means and methods how to put an end to exile and his woes. They surely knew that the one doesn't enter that perilous domain with impunity. That Satan's word also counts in heaven. But they took up the challenge. And they did what they had to do, learning from the most secret of all secret books. Then they died far from each other. Their followers must have been heartbroken. But as always in the Hasidic movement, they learned how to overcome disappointment, misfortune, and sadness. But what about the Rabbi of Gair himself? Still adolescent, was he affected by all these dramatic events? Or was he shielded by his young age? In Kozhenitz, where he grew up, he was admired for his exceptional erudition and eloquence. Many legends circulated around that. Whenever there was a need for someone to go on a mission to defend Hasidism against accusations of other Hasidic masters or of Hasidic ignorance, he was chosen for the task. 
had a historical oratory dispute between old school of Pschischre and the young school of Lublin that was arranged at a rabbinic wedding at a place called Ostila. He played an important role, an important part. He would refute any reproach and criticism with persuasive arguments. His learning helped him win many battles. It is said that he slept little, two or three hours. His wife and friends invoked medical reasons, trying to persuade him to think of his health and his answer to his wife was, why did your father make me marry you? Because for some reasons and in some circles, I was known as a prodigy. What is a prodigy? Someone who learns fast. Well, I, I sleep fast. Why has he left the Kozhenitz community where he was loved and appreciated? Perhaps because they loved him there too much uncritically. He objected to honors and flattery. They could be a threat to one's idea of himself. I, he once said, need someone to tear my flesh, not someone to caress it. That may be why he left the court of Kozhenitz and its warrant for Pschischre, where the great Rabbi Rebunam in the footsteps of Rabbi Yatschow Yitzchak, the Jew, had established a new school where rigor and discipline were strict guidelines. He welcomed the new disciple with open tenderness, and yet the newcomer was still beardless. Actually, the separation from Pschischre represented an important moment in his life. You must remember that after the passing of the preacher of Mezheritz or Kozhenitz, things were never the same. In Kozhenitz, surely not. The son of the preacher, Moshe, did not have his father's statue. Known mainly for his piety and devotion, he wept all the time, but not enough for his learning. No wonder that the young student from Warsaw, who lived in meditation and study, did not feel completely at home there. He felt better in Pschischre. When he returned from his visit, he found his first son dead. It con he connected two events. So did the leader he left behind. To his close followers, the young rabbi of Kozhenitz remarked, he, the rabbi of Ger perturbed my Sabbath. Now he will be perturbed. And since then, we are told, history repeated itself. Strangely, each visit to Pschischre resulted in another death. Some say 13, Others say 17 times when he visited Pschischre, and both numbers figure in the Chronicles. 13 or 17 funerals followed. At one of them, the, mor the mourning father said, the day will come when we both, both of us, the Rabbi of Kozhenitz and I, will be in heaven together. Then I will sue him before the celestial tribunal. The Rabbi of Ger, a tragic figure? Yes. The most tragic? Perhaps. Others were inflicted by melancholy. We discussed it here at this place several years ago. The greatest of the masters, the best, the founder of the movement himself, or the seer of Lublin, or Rabbi Nachman of Bratzlar, went through periods of great and deep depression. 
But surprising as it may sound, he, the first rabbi of Ger, who may have had better reasons than they, did not. Again, was he spared by his deep, incommensurable, unfathomable love for learning that protected him? When Rabbi Bunam of Pshischa passed away, the circle of close friends waited a traditional month of mourning before looking for a worthy successor. Two were considered worthy candidates and both refused. One of them, the future master Rabbi Mendel of Kotsk, who at that time lived in Tomashov, and his friend, Rabbi Yitzhak Meir of Ger. Both had been very close to the late master. In fact, the latter was at his bedside during his last hours, listening to his last words. And Rabbi Bunam asked him to burn all his writings to the last page. Nothing ought to be spared from the flames. Why? He gave no reason. And it, his disciple didn't ask for any explanation. And he obeyed. Which reminds us of another great master, Rabbi Nachman of Bratzlav, who had given similar instructions to his faithful follower, Rabbi Nathan of Nemirov, who also obeyed. But then let us also remember in parentheses the great Franz Kafka and his friend Max Brod. Kafka told Brod same thing, burn all my writings. And thank God, his friend had the courage to disobey. But that's another story. As for the Rabbi of Ger, our hero tonight, he himself burned some of his own writings, of his own commentaries. Once at the request of his friend, the Mendel of Kotsk, and another time because, well, we don't know why. In both cases, he threw his own writings, his own works, into the fire while shedding bitter tears. Strange, the, this desire to erase all written traces. Was it to avoid false readings and interpretations or to maintain the quality of the oral tradition that characterized early Hasidism just as did early Talmudic lessons? The best himself actually hasn't left any of his teachings in written form. When someone showed him some notes taken from his sessions, he said, nothing there is mine. It is the evil spirits. As I mentioned earlier, both Rabbi Mendel of and Rabbi Yitzhak Meir, true companions and devoted friends of the school of Pshis, both refused the honor. Each pointed to the other, let him become the master's heir and successor. Finally, for the sake of Pshis, it was left up to them to decide. And they met at a village named Samut, isolated in an inn, located deep in the woods. They talked and talked. What they said to one another, the arguments they used, the tone of their voices, no one knows to this day. But we do know that both emerged victorious. One returned to Tomashov and Kotsk and the other to Warsaw. Nevertheless, we also know that the future Rabbi of Ger saw in his friend the worthy successor to Rabbi Bunam and became his follower. Furthermore, he wanted everyone to follow his example. Whenever he met a young student thirsty for learning, he almost admonished him. What? You are here with me? You have not been in Tomashov yet? Go there 
and you will feel what our ancestors felt at Sinai. Ah, the wonderful and wonderfully disquieting Krabi Mendel of Kotsk. We have evoked him here with fear and trembling years ago. Obsessed with truth alone, he sought its fiery power in extreme solitude and rigor. I revered this teacher, guide and master, for whom life was meant to be a battlefield where one must walk, run on the razor's edge, forever oscillating between the dizziness of the height and the fear of the abyss. Why did he avoid those who left their families behind and came to be with him? We shall return to him. But we are still in Gare, a small village or city near Warsaw, which in Hasidic followers is even more famous and surely more meaningful than Warsaw itself. Rabbi Yitzhak Meir is still there in Warsaw, living with his father-in-law who supported him and his family. His spouse, Feigele, worked in a textile store which her father purchased for her. That was not infrequent in those times in the world of Jews in Eastern Europe. The wife worked so as to allow her husband to explore and study the depth of religious wisdom. I know today it doesn't sound right. After all, the wife, the wife should always work and the husband never. But then at that time, who knows? Were the women actually, were the wives happy? We are told that they were. But who knows? Well, she worked, the wife worked simply to allow her husband to study. So for a while she was the bread giver in the family until the crisis erupted. Soon things changed. At one point in 1831, the new political situation, the Polish insurrection provoking Russian reprisals affected Jews as well. And in the battles, the textile store was demolished. The master's father-in-law, Remoishe Halfan, was forced to financially support the nationalist rebels. And their defeat resulted in his own downfall. Everything he had was lost. At one point he was arrested. And since then the Rebbe's family often suffered from hunger. Literally. The great Talmudic scholar chose to go to work himself. He became the director of a factory that produced wool for prayer shawls. Naturally, the learned erudite scholar was a weak businessman. It ended in total failure. Then he tried selling books. Same results. Failure. How about publishing books? He tried and failed. Speaking of his poverty, he once commented, if I so wish, I could obtain from heaven to make money, but I prefer to submit to God's will than to ask him to submit to my own. If economic troubles were insufficient, they were followed by more serious ones. Suspected of helping the insurgents, like his father-in-law, he the master was imprisoned by the Russian authorities. For how long, again, we must admit our lack of precision. We don't know. A day? A night? Longer? What is certain is that he shared his prison cell with underworld criminals and that his arrest provoked a wave of public protest, not only among Hasidim, but also among their antagonists and even among Christians. So much so that the authorities had to offer him official apologies and asked him to stay put at home. Still, no longer being safe and secure, he felt the need to change his address and name. From Rottenberg, which he was called before, he became Alter. 
At the same time, or soon afterwards, Warsaw lost his chief rabbi, Reb Shleim Zalman. The entire community was plunged into mourning. For 30 days, no public celebrations were allowed. No music was played at any gathering. Women would not wear jewelry in the street. So beloved was their spiritual leader. For his succession, the community's dignitaries and notables turned to Rabbi Tzchak Meir, our hero tonight, offering him a very high salary. And he said no. Other invitations came from prestigious communities, near and far. He still said no. In the meantime, his reputation grew wild and wider reaching religious and social spheres beyond and outside the Hasidic world. When the school of Pshischa needed someone to delegate to other masters to explain to them the Hasidic message, it was to him they turned. When a delegation of Jewish leaders had to go and visit Sir Moses Montefiore to inform him of the plight of poor, impoverished Jewish families in Warsaw, he was part of it. There we have an interesting story which I heard from his descendant, Shlomo Shamir. And he said that when he met Sir Moses in Montefiore, he asked him to intervene with the authorities, not to force Jewish school children to learn Russian. They only had to learn Talmud, Hebrew and Yiddish. But why not learn foreign language, wondered Montefiore. If Mordecai from the book of Esther in Persia had not studied Persian, the foreign language of the time, he wouldn't have understood the high officials, Biktan and Teresh, who conspired to kill King Asuerus. And therefore, therefore, actually, because of him understanding what they wanted to do, the king or the emperor, his life was saved. And therefore, later on, the Jews were saved. You may be right, said the Rebbe, but if Jewish children had learned Persian in Jewish schools, the two conspirators would have known that they knew and that he knew Persian. And then they would have been more careful not to chat about it in the presence of Mordechai the Jew. Nevertheless, his argument was a better one. When a dramatic debate we spoke about it between representatives of the two factions in Hasidism and the historic wedding of Ostila, one side spokesman for the Lublin establishment those of the dissident Pshischa on the other, his voice was dominant in general. What was his role outside the Hasidic world? We don't know. We really don't. Some sources maintain that his arrest was due to his activities against the forced anti-assimilationist policy of the government. Together with Rabbi Yitzhak Ovorki, the man who established a school, the School of Silence, the man who was asked once by a friend of his how he learned silence, he didn't answer. <laughs> but together the two fought against the laws prohibiting Jews from wearing their traditional garments and beards. And in that fight, they also had to combat fellow Jews who preached total emancipation. Inside the Hasidic community itself, opinions varied. Facing the question whether pious Jews ought to violate the laws and risk prison or even death, some answered in the affirmative. Others, surprisingly including the Rabbi of Kotsk, declared that the choice of garments to be worn does not derive from biblical law and do not deserve to go to the limits of choosing death rather than transgression. After all, they said, didn't Uncle Esau wear Gentile clothes when he appeared before his father Jacob? Eventually, the anti-Hasidic laws were defeated. Was it because of the Hasidic protests? We don't know. But they were. 
And the Rabbi of Ger continued to live his life fully in Hasidic universe, which suddenly underwent a convulsion, which on all levels, in every family at home, produced powerful shock waves. And it came from Kotsk, the friend of our hero. From Kotsk, where Rabbi Mendel began a process of personal withdrawal from his fervent, if not ecstatic, followers. He slowly but irrevocably made himself inaccessible, invisible, unreachable to them. Locked in a secret quest which no one could explain, in his small room, through a hole in the wall, he would observe students in prayer and discussions. And when he appeared, usually at night, they were seized with panic and ran away. Only two persons were allowed to see him, his servant Rabbi Hersh Tomashover and his friend Rabbi Yitzhak Meir of Ger. They did nothing to explain his retreat from anyone else. There too we have already studied here his life and teachings long ago. His dark fire continues to burn in my memory. His isolation aroused curiosity and anguish and also resentment in his own circle. At the end, one of his favorite disciples, the Mordechai Yosef, together with a group of dissatisfied dissidents, left him and established their own little kingdom in a place called Ibiza, Izbice. And they were a minority. Most disciples stayed at least in the beginning where they were, and one of them explained his attitude. The Talmud tells us of Rabban Gamliel's school that in the time of Hillel the Elder, only he whose inner life was reflected in his outside behavior was admitted inside. And for him, the gates were open. Others were rejected. Added the Hasid. In Kotsk, what we do is simple. If the doors are locked, we break the glass and enter through the window. In Kotsk itself, there was fear that the future Rabbi of Ger may join the dissidents. There were rumors to this effect, all unfounded. He remained faithful. The Mendel thanked him for his loyalty. You, Yitzhak Meir, he said, did not forget me, and I shall remember it until my last day. So maybe imagine his friend happy. How could he be when so many Jews in the region still in exile and during oppression? And then also, how could a father who lost one child after another be happy? How could he be happy in 1839 when in Kotsk things were worsening daily? Remendel the secretive master, his great and fearsome friend and teacher, was taken ill and refused to see doctors. The Rabbi of Ger was urged to intercede with him. He hurried there immediately, and the two friends spent hours together. And the illustrious, stubborn patient gave in. He took medications for a while, then he stopped. The word spread that the end was nearing. Wishing to be there, disciples and followers converged on his home. They recited psalms, praying with their heart and soul for these days to be prolonged. He heard them and commented they would do better to spend their energy in study. Death did not frighten him. To his son-in-law, the Babrom of Sochachov, the Avni Eza, he whispered, What is there to be afraid of? One leaves one room for another, a better one. And he added, study is what matters. He closed his eyes forever. Rabbi Yitzhak Meir was present at the funeral. He wept saying, you don't even know what you just lost. Thus was officially born the school of Ger. Was it different from Kotsk? Very different, surely in style more bestian, accentuating collective fervor, more than on solitary meditation. Here, young students were not chased away, 
too many arrived, never enough for those who loved learning in depth a page, a problem in ancient Talmudic and their medieval commentaries. What was essential was the total connection with Torah, which means both practice and study. Hundreds, rumors spoke of thousands, of followers hurried to spend Passover under his roof. He would tell them, listen, I am not just a regular teacher for everyone. I don't need money, honors. I had enough in my life. I don't need more now. What I desire most is to have you penetrated by truth, by helping you come closer to our Father in heaven. And he who wants something else, his place is not here. Eventually he left Warsaw for nearby Ger. His academy, his yeshiva, his school attracted the best students as well as their teachers, whose colleagues and friends he wanted to be. Among them was the greatest who embodied Hasidic thought, such as Reb Heinoch of Alexander, Rabbi Akiva Eiger, Reb Asriel Kharif, Reb Hesh Ashkenazi, Reb Shloim Seifer, Reb Schol Salanta, the renowned, inspiring founder of the Musar movement. What attracted so many people from so many spheres? He did not perform miracles. He was just a spiritual guide on whom they could lean in moments of distress or doubt. To them, his words had both strength and weight and occasional humor that resonated with joy in their hearts. One day he remarked, it happens that you hear someone declaring that he is giving up on the world, but is the world really his for him to renounce it? And also, one of the ten curses that God sent upon Pharaoh's Egypt was darkness. The text says, man no longer saw his brother and not one moved from this place, commented the teacher. It means that he who does not see his brother will not move from his place in darkness. Incidentally, the Rabbi of Kotsk interpreted the same words differently. It is not said he that people did not see one another because of the darkness. No. It was because they did not see one another that darkness existed. In other words, their own darkness was the curse in Egypt. Another day, Rebishak May recalled the sins of our ancestors committed while wandering in the desert. He said, remember, he said, it is also with their sins that the Torah, that scripture was made, and this. The Torah tells us that the voice of God was heard at Sinai. That means, according to the translation of the Targum, that it continued to reverberate uninterruptedly, which means until today. For it is written, Hayom, which means today. You will hear my voice. And today means today, now. And also, in the Yom Kippur, the name of the great pardon sermon, he quoted Hillel the Elder, who said, If I am not from myself, who will be? And if I do not what I must do, who will do it? And if not now, when? The Rebbe went deeper into the question, When will this now be here? This now has never existed before and will never exist again. As the Book of Splendor, the holy mystical book, the Zohar, says, the garments of the morning are not the same as those of the evening. He loved to speak of the inner point. He wrote Hebrew poems. He was a man who knew so much of so many fields, so many areas. He says, why did God tell Abraham in the Bible, the man of absolute faith, not to worry, said he, because Abraham did worry. Abraham worried that God might find another messenger worthier than he. After all, he loved to quote a Meshulay Sassover's aphorism who said, the world is dangerous like a sword's edge. There is an abyss on one side and an abyss 
on the other. In 1866, at the age of 67, he fell ill, physically and mentally exhausted. A leg wound gave him atrocious pain. On another level, he could not bear the thought that the new law would have compelled Talmudic students to enlist for military service, which would surely stop them from learning sacred texts. So on the eve of Yom Kippur, he shouted with all his strength, we must do something. We must do everything to prevent students of Torah from being torn away from Torah. Following the solemn and poignant evening office of Neila, which is the closure of the of the whole, the whole ceremony. He turned to a confidant and whispered, I will not live through the coming year. I know it. Every year at this hour, I would see Prophet Elijah, who would wear white clothes and smile at me. This evening he seemed angry. Several weeks afterwards, after disturbing signals appeared one Shabbat, the biblical portion was read dealing with the sacrifice of the red cow, which the sages interpreted as atonement for the death of one just man. That afternoon, during the mystic, mystical third meal, the, disciple, the disciples were unable to chant the usual hymns. Fifteen minutes before the end of the Sabbath, the rabbi recited a psalm which one reads at funerals. In the middle, he stopped and returned his soul, his soul to his creator. And the Hasidim lamented, woe to a world that has lost its leader, and woe to the sheep that has lost its captain. A great darkness has descended upon the world, echoed Rabbi Yehrom of Chekhanov. The, blim, the blipman of Radomsk broke down in tears. I have nothing more to do in this world. I must ascend heaven to welcome the Rabbi of Ger next Sabbath with a special song. He died that Sabbath while studying the Book of Splendor. But the first Rabbi of Ger left a heritage, as a heritage, an entire school, an entire movement that still attracted hundreds of followers and disciples. They are recognized by their allegiance to his memory and by their love for his work. His immediate successors, particularly the Svasamis of Language of Truth, brought new vigor and lasting honor to his name and accomplishments. Their Hasidim are also known for their solidarity. It is characterized by the following story which I heard from a Gerard Hasid in the Stiebel on the hundred and Second Street, or First Street in Manhattan. One day, the Rabbi asked one of his followers, how is a certain Hasid? He used to daven here with us. I don't know, the man answered. I haven't seen him for a long time. What? Said the Rabbi. You are both followers of Ger. You both study the same sources, repeat the same stories, and decide the same prayers. And you don't know what your fellow Hasid is doing? whether he is happy in his business and at peace with his fate, whether his family is healthy, whether his daughters are married, whether they have children, and you consider yourself a follower of Ger. Several evenings, several times this evening, we have mentioned his tragic destiny. Tragic it was. Year after year, a child was gone, in a house of mourning, he observed the laws of mourning. Each time he sat down for the Shiva period and recovered. How did he cope with so much pain? How did he go on living, praying, studying, and teaching while waiting for the next funeral of another one of his children? The last of his sons, Olav who died at 40 in 1855, leaving behind a widow with many young children. Family, relatives, friends, and simple Hasidim cried at the funeral. To his wife, the Rabbi said, our faith will be a consolation to others who on similar occasions would be able to say his Hakmeir's sorrows were greater than ours. And he didn't complain, so why should we? I must say that at least I heard one descendant of the Rabbi, 
And we see it again, I quote him, Shlomo Shamir, who said that he doesn't think the whole thing happened. That is so frequent in Hasidism. Uh, you hear a story and immediately the, the opposite. And, but his argument is that if we don't know where the 17 graves are. I still believe the story happened. As I said earlier, I heard it in the Gerrerstibel from survivors of Treblinka. And they quoted it each time the greatest tragedy was evoked. Is it possible, is it even conceivable, that at least to his distant followers, his tragedy was meant to be an example to be followed a century or two later by a different kind of survivors? As a rule, I always worry over analogies when we deal with the unspeakable event. Therefore, I tell the story of the first rabbi response to tragedy not as an answer. I fervently believe that in this respect there is no answer. But I tell it simply as a desire to include it in the vast framework of our collective memory. That wounded memory is condemned to remain until the end of times, an eternal question mark which God alone must answer. Thank you. What do you think? <clears throat> Thoughts, questions, comments about anything? Wow, that's the main thought I would have. Wow. <laughs> Just wow, he is so amazing. His whole life is amazing. Wow. Wow, big wow. Um, no. Lots of drama, many details, lots of history, lots of uh, Yiddishkeit. Um, stories of succession, dramatic story of a, of, of a friendship between Menachem Mendel of Kotsk and Yitzhak Meir of Ger. Um, Menachem Mendel of Kotsk was known as a recluse. As Professor Wiesel pointed out, he, uh, he retreated into his home. Uh, he, he, uh, Yitzhak Meir was one of only two people whom he would even see or talk to. Why? Well, it's, I think the Menachem Mendel could not, could, was looking for, he had what Abraham Joshua Heschel called a passion for truth. Uh, for emet, which is uh, the word emet, the word for truth, consists of the first, the middle, and the last letter of the Hebrew alphabet. Therefore, truth encompasses all. Okay. Uh, truth of what? Uh, truth of our relation to God, truth of God, truth of who we are, truth of our identity, uh, truth of Torah. So where where is Torah to be found? I, mean, I think in Menachem Mendel, and Yitzhak Meir, you have the two, two dimensions of truth. Um, you have the turn inward, and you have the turn outward. Um, Rabbi Yitzhak uh, uh, Meir of Ger was known to uh, turn outward to his community, to live, to, you know, to the living Torah. Uh, you can't live Torah in isolation. No, this is true. You can't be 
you know, righteous all by yourself. Um, the danger of isolation is blindness. Um, Hasidism is, is noted for its accent on uh, a, a, a liberation from our isolation, from our solitude in ourselves. Even then, if Menachem Mendel of Coates took, made that retreat, perhaps it was uh, for the sake not only of knowing truth, but of knowing dark, the darkness that the truth might overcome. So uh, Professor Wiesel noted that the, you know, the ninth plague of Egypt, the plague of darkness, was characterized by an inner darkness, an inner blindness to the face of, of, of our fellow human being. And one way in which we, our, our eyes are open so that we might see is to seek out that uh, relationship uh, through, through love of neighbor and love of stranger by saying, here I am to someone else. It's, it's when we say, here I am, that we come to behold the face of the neighbor. It's not that we first behold the face and then say, here I am, seems to me that it's, it's, it's in the utterance of here I am that our eyes open. That's one of the messages of Gare. Uh, Pedro, my, my colleague, Dr. Gonzalez, go ahead. You have a question? Uh, hi, uh, good, good evening, everyone. Uh, uh, Dr. Patterson, uh, thank you. Uh, I was thinking that um, in the last uh, uh, session, uh, Professor Vizel uh, spoke about the soul, and I think in your remarks, uh, you reminded us that the uh, Shoah uh, happens uh, in the soul or to the soul, right? Uh, in this session, yeah. Professor Vizel uh, speaks of the mind and the soul and the need of these two to be sharpened. So I wonder if you can comment on how this happens. I mean, uh, yes. <clears throat> and, and, and how can we relate that to um, collective memory and survivors? Thank you. <laughs> that easy and simple question, uh, Dr. Gonzalez. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, um, no, thank you for, and for reminding me. Professor Bizel, as, as I think we may have noted last week, once said that one of the, the ultimate mystery of the Shoah is that whatever happened took place in the soul. Um, what does it mean? Where does the soul live? And where do, do, do the, the events in the life of the soul transpire? Uh, I think in, in Menachem Mendel and Yitzhak Meir, we see where the soul lives. The soul lives within and the soul lives around. We, we, in uh, Kabbalistic tradition, we speak of the inner light and the surrounding light that, that make up the soul. Uh, if I think of Menachem Mendel of Kos, that's where you see the inner light, the internal uh, burn. That's where his soul is on fire. With Yitzhak Meir of Ger, you, he's surrounded by fire. It's what we call the Or uh, Sovev, or the Or Makif, the surrounding light. In the Shoah, there was an assault on both. There was an assault on the inner life and the outer life. This is an assault on our, our sense of identity and an assault on our human-to-human -human relation. That's how you kill the soul. You kill the relation. You kill the identity. So that in the aftermath, the task of remembrance is, is a remembrance not only of who we are, not only of our own name, our own language. You remember the issue of learning a foreign language came up? One of the reasons that the Israelites were able to emerge from Egypt is that they didn't forget their language, their identity. Language is internal and language is surrounding. The, 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 the language is the stuff of the soul. 
So remembrance is remembering who we are, how our own name, our own language, our Hebrew name, our own, our, 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 the name that we're baptized with, whatever our holy name is, so that we can answer when we're called. And uh, so knowing who we are entails being able to say, here I am for you. Memory is a saying of here I am. Uh, testimony is a saying of here I am for you. And this is even more powerful with Yitzhak Meir of Ger, the one who buried 17 children oh. and, and yet did not succumb. Um, the Jewish people have buried, uh, you know, six million whose graves we don't even know. And yet we, 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 we can't succumb to despair because despair leads to forgetfulness. Um, I know I'm all over the place in my response to you. Uh, but uh, the, the, but uh, Yitzhak Meir of Ger is all over the place as well. Let me hear, let me hear from our, the Rav, Rabbi Yitzhak. Go on. Wait, you, you unmute, unmute. You're muted. You're still muted. Okay. 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 Number one, it was a fascinating, uh, uh, fascinating uh, history of Rabbi uh, um, of Gel. I happened to be. I was very close to the Gel Hasidim growing up. I used to go to actually his great, uh, his great grandson. His great grandson was Rabbi Yitzchak Meir, who was the founder of the Ger dynasty. And then the Sfat Emet, his son, Rabbi Yudha Leib. And then the grandson, Rabbi Abba Mordechai, who actually was the first one to come to Israel. He came when it was still Palestine. And he died during the, in the War of Independence. And uh, <laughs> interesting, because uh, they were bombing uh, all over the place, so they couldn't bring him to uh, for burial on Haraz 18, on Mount Alams, where the cemetery was at the time. So the yeshiva, the called Sfat Emet, is the Ger yeshiva, was near Machane Yehuda, you know, very in a in a in a little in a little uh, street, uh, going down to a section called Mekor Baruch, really. So there's the yeshiva. So they buried him in the uh, in the back of the yeshiva. In other words, within the yeshiva grounds, and until today, you know. So as kids, we always used to go and put in kvitlach, and you know. And then, of course, I had the great privilege, really, with my uncle, who was very close to uh, the Ger Rebbe. Uh, when I grew up, uh, the Rebbe Soel Alter, he wrote the book Beis Yisrael. He was known as the Beis Yisrael, just as the Chidush Harim is known as Chidush Harim, and uh, because of the book he wrote, the Chidush Harim. It's a chidushim. It's the new interpretations and commentaries of Harav Yitzchok Meir. You know, so Harim is the acronym. And I would suggest uh, to just get a little taste of the uh, of the uh, of the of the Harim of uh, of Rabbi Yitzchok Meir of Ger. Is uh, I mean, I'm sure today you can surf the internet and find. Uh, you know, uh, just push. Uh, you know, it's just. Uh, and to Yitzchak Meir of Geo, Harim, and you find the many Chidushim. I have a couple of books here, Chidush Harim. Chidush Harim ala Torah. I mean, his interpretations on the Torah are unbelievably deep. And, uh, and they call him Chidushim from the word Chadash, which means a new. It's something that nobody else interpreted this way. Uh, yes, he quotes uh, the Talmud, he quotes uh, everybody else, but he saw it in a different, different way. Uh, the Ger Hasidim and the Ger Rebbe's are known to be very sharp people, you know, quick to answer. And until today, you go in, you go to Gehula with a Ger, you know, and you talk to a Ger Hasid, that's one, two, three. And I think it comes down all the way from the Chidush Arim, who was uh, known to have been uh, a very, uh, a very sharp and a very deep uh, a person. Now, I didn't know, it's interesting, I didn't know, and I, um, I followed, of course, the girl, the bells and all, but I didn't know of the, uh, 
of the great uh, sorrows that he suffered. I didn't know. Ibn Ahmed of Baksha was a known fact. But the Chidush Harim, I didn't know that. You know, I didn't know that. 17 children, I didn't know. You know, so he brought up some unbelievable, I mean, he captured his personality in a way that uh, only Professor Wazel can. Yes, it's, that's fascinating. <laughs> fascinating. And this is, and let me just point out to my uh, colleagues here and uh, my fellow congregants and students, we have in Rabbi Cohen a living connection to the Gera Rebbe, as he just laid out for us, a living connection. Um, Menachem Mendel of Kosk once said that he who he screams loudest who screams silently. I think maybe the Gera Rebbe screams silently. Uh -huh. well, his children. Um, but it's maybe his greatness was that this that that he transformed this darkness that that befell him into a deeper light, a deeper vision of his fellow Jews, his fellow human beings. And that's the question, really, that that we see in Kotsk and we see in Ger. Mm -hmm. What do we do with the darkness? What did the Rebbe's do with the darkness? We live in the aftermath of the kingdom of night, the kingdom of darkness, a choshech, <clears throat> the darkness that's the, 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 the darkness of Egypt is called choshech, just like the darkness <laughs> over the face of the deep, darkness that the light of the Holy One overcomes in the beginning and we are summoned to overcome as we continue the creation in a covenant with the creator. Um, and it becomes most urgent when we face most profoundly what is most devastating to us. I mean, what could be what could be more devastating? Some of you here have children. Most of you here have children. I know those who are young. What yeah. more devastating? I won't even say it. I can't even, I can't even speak it. Okay. The true horror. Losing battery. Um, and so with the Gera Rebbe turned to battery. How do you turn to Torah? You turn to Torah for him by turning to your neighbor. That's mm. Torah is. That's where Torah is. It's in the face of your neighbor. The blindness to the face of the neighbor of the, of the plague of darkness is a blindness to Torah. It's not just that the Torah illuminates the face of the neighbor. The face of the neighbor illuminates the Torah itself. If we, if we, It's like, I mean, Elie Wiesel once said that those who come to God empty-handed encounter God as emptiness. Ah. Those who come to the Torah, which is a manifestation of God, empty-handed, empty of love, empty of questions, empty of concern, empty of passion, encounter the Torah as empty, as emptiness as well. Encounter the Torah, God forbid, as a quaint and curious volume of literature. Uh, I'm resisting the temptation to get started on that, but, but and my colleagues here who are professors and scholars know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, but you can see, a uh, professor pro Elie Wiesel was a professor himself, right? Um, and you can, we, we can only imagine what it was like to sit in his classroom. Actually, there's, a, there's an excellent book by one of his former students called Witness. Witness. And it's by Ariel Berger, B-U-R-G-E-R. Everybody, can everyone see Professor Gonzalez? Witness by Ariel Berger. Uh, a winner of the National Jewish Book Award, a wonderful <laughs> volume on 
Professor Wiesel as a teacher. Um, yeah. As a teacher of Torah. Sometimes without ever, you know, mentioning Torah. Um, but we saw tonight, we saw what a teacher Professor Wiesel was. Man, did he cover, he covered the universe. A universe. Yeah. I mean, every line was yeah. <clears throat> was laden with references and allusions and teachings. Hey, Dr. Patterson, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm rich. Number one, how do you support to you for bringing uh, these absolutely magnificent uh, uh, lectures uh, to us? So we owe you a debt of gratitude, certainly. Uh, you are the, the catalyst. It's because of you that we have this, that we're able to uh, actually uh, uh, study and learn of all the great masters. Uh, but, you know, in your introduction, you said something about Hasidism. That is very, very important to understand that the motto of Hasidism is, as King David says, Ivdu et Hashem besimcha bo lefanav birnana. Worship God or serve God with happiness, come before him with song. And this was certainly, yes. you know, uh, and some, some Hasidic writings is more than others. But I'll tell you that in Gur, in Gel, at least when I went to, to the, the, to the where there were a thousand people on a Shabbos in, in Yerushalayim, in the Gel uh, Yeshiva and uh, the, the, and, 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 and the, and the synagogue, uh, everything is about song. Everything is about marches. That's yes. right. That's the idea. Yes. So, yeah, it gives you a certain uplift that you, you know, right there and then you feel that you have entered the Garden of Eden all of a sudden, you know. It's, no, and this is, this is really a crucial point. It's, that is the Hasidic message. Joy and thanksgiving. Song. Songs, songs of joy and, and songs of thanksgiving. The dance, your dance counts for more than my prayers, the Hasidic masters would say. Uh, especially when we have lost all sight of any reason to rejoice or to be thankful. There's a Hasidic saying, it says, in all the world, there's just one place where a great treasure is hidden, and that place is the spot where you're standing. Ah, right. How do you see it. How do, how, how do we see it? We see it through eyes filled with gratitude and rejoicing. All right. And then we can see what there is to be thankful for and what there is to rejoice in. Then we realize that we've been unhappy because we've forgotten that we were happy. <laughs> we've forgotten. Uh, what a, that God was here all along, like Jacob says, when he wakes up from his dream, God was here all along and I didn't know it. Even, and we get this from people like the Rebbe, Yisak Meir of Ger, who, who has lived through some of the more, most horrific events that, that a father can live through, that a human can live through. Um, but it, Nobody has a monopoly on suffering. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Everyone here has wept. Everyone here has wept. Um, which is all the more reason for us to reach out to, to others who have wept. Yeah. Yeah. Right? That's the Hasidic. That's Hasidic. It's here I am for you. Let us Zehayom Asa Hashem Nagila. This this day, God has made this day. Let us be glad and rejoice in it together. Right. together. And not, not just because of, but also in sometimes in spite of. Sometimes in spite of. I'm losing my battery. I lost my battery over here. Wow. Uh, 
Oh, I have a great comment from Brenda. Thank you, Brenda. Marika said, she says, when I studied the Hasidic movement, a rabbi said that Zorba the Greek was a Hasid. <laughs> told his students to dance when they experienced sorrow. Yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Zorba, if, if you know Zorba the Greek. <laughs> yes. He's a character in a novel by Nikos Kazantzakis, who was a friend yeah. of Rizel, by the way, Kazantzakis. <laughs> There's an episode in Zorba the Greek when Zorba loses his, his God forbid, his three-year-old child. And at the funeral, Zorba started dancing around the small grave. And, he, and, and Zorba is telling the story. And everybody said, Zorba's gone mad. Zorba has gone mad. He's gone insane. But then Zorba says, had I not started dancing, I would have gone insane. Correct. I would have gone insane. Yeah. Um, it's like, you know, one of the Hasidic masters, Moshe Leib of Sassoff, once said, when somebody asks of me the impossible, I know what I must do. I must dance. Yeah. So, uh, Yisak Meir of Ger was, was one who knew how to dance, knew how to sing, knew how to rejoice when when it looked insane it looks insane to many but but uh those who take him to be insane don't hear the music when they when he's dancing well said <laughs> well yes. said yes it is well yes, said. Koch, yes, Koch, yes, Koch. god bless you thank you all next week uh, we, we've done so far job uh Eliezer uh, Ben Hirkanas, great Talmudic sage, great Hasidic master, and, and next week we'll move to God himself. Wow. The solitude of God. Let me just say a, a word of thanks to the 92nd Street Y. Um, the, I, I, have a, I have a good friend and student who was a student of Elie Wiesel named Alan Rosen, great Holocaust scholar, and I'll talk one day about him. Maybe I'll have him come talk with us. Uh, he is compiling a, a, a catalog and summary of all the lectures at the 92nd Street Y should be published in the fall. So maybe at that time, I'll have Alan Rosen join us. In the meantime, uh, thanks to the, the, the 92nd Street Y, we have one more, uh, one more treasure uh, a week from tonight, next Tuesday, 7 o'clock. Tune in to uh, tune in for God. <laughs> in the meantime, be blessed, be safe, be well. Thank you all. <laughs>